I want to share a story with you guys today about a guy who went from 19 years in prison to 39 and a half years in prison for the same exact charge. As I was becoming familiar with this story, the first thought going through my mind was, this sounds like double jeopardy. Well, boy, would I learn some things about what double jeopardy is and some loopholes for some loopholes, which I'll be sharing with you guys in this video. The story that I share with you takes place in the state of Kentucky. This is going to be a heavily political story as it seems the last couple of prison-related news stories I've shared with you guys have been, except this one's quite a bit different. This may also scream white privilege to some, or maybe some thoughts in relation to addiction. Should this situation have been looked at any differently because possibly the guy in question in this story suffered from addiction? There's a lot of different variables to what I'm getting ready to share with you. I don't want to spend any more time on the buildup. Let me just go ahead and get right into this thing. And trust me when I tell you, this is a shocking story that I'm just learning about and was just in the news two days ago. Again, folks, this story takes place in the state of Kentucky. Let me introduce you to this guy right here, Patrick Baker. Now, I'm not sure how old this guy is, but back in 2014, Patrick Baker and a few other folks would try to pull off a drug heist, actually, well, a drug robbery. And the way that they wanted to go about trying to do this was, I'm not sure if everybody did, I would imagine everybody did, but it does mention at least Patrick Baker dressing up as a fake U.S. Marshal and then attempting to carry out what would end up being a very much botched drug raid. And in fact, what would end up coming from this would be a drug robbery killing. Actually, what it would be referred to in the first news story that I ran across about all of this. And in fact, what the story would say was Baker was convicted of a brazen act of violence, one that resulted in a murder committed while the victim's family was nearby. Baker was convicted of killing Donald Mills, a drug dealer in Knox County, while trying to rob Mills of cash and pain pills, Baker posed as a U.S. Marshal during the crime. Mills' pregnant wife and children were held at gunpoint while Baker ransacked the home for oxycodone pills. As I was reading this story and learning the details surrounding it, it reminded me of something that I had heard about when I was 18 years old, first starting to get in trouble we're talking 20 plus years ago, but in the jail, this was a pretty popular story and I wish I knew more details about it or could, you know, find this. I haven't looked for it, but I remember hearing this story uh, about a similar situation, a botched drug robbery gone wrong. And unfortunately in that case, sad, I mean, just horrendous, as heinous as it possibly could get, uh, a child lost their life. And in fact, if I can remember correctly, and don't quote me on this, but I want to say that it was something about, you know, these guys went up into this house, the guy that had the drugs wasn't there, but the guy's girlfriend was there, the kids were there, they were asking the girlfriend, like, to open a safe, or where are the drugs at, she didn't know, and a child was killed in the process of this. They had caught the guys who did that, and I, I'm going to try to look that story up and see if I can find any information about that, and, you know, hopefully they got life, or better. This story is pretty crazy itself. So again, in 2014, Patrick Baker would go up into this house dressed up as a fake U.S. Marshal to rob Donald Mills looking for oxycodone pills. Was Patrick Baker... Suffering from addiction, should that have been taken into account? Like, you know, he wasn't in his right frame of mind when he did this. They go up into the house. They hold the whole family at gunpoint, ransacking the house, trying to find the drugs. At some point, I would read this, and I want to say allegedly, uh, Donald Mills would get a gun himself, and Patrick Baker would say, you know, the reason why he shot Donald Mills is because Donald Mills pulled a gun on him. And I want to go to another story about this case. I'll link all of the stories and information that I have surrounding this case down in the descriptions below if you guys would like to read this information for yourself. Uh, right here is a picture of Donald Mills, the guy that lost his life. Patrick Baker was convicted, among other things, of reckless homicide 
and impersonating a peace officer for the incident in 2014. And when Patrick Baker would get sentenced for the second time, the story would say Baker did not address the court and one of his lawyers stated that he maintains his innocence and is unable to express remorse because he intends to appeal. Now, I'm not sure what this guy intends to appeal upon. How is this guy innocent? Um, if this was the gunman, if this, if Patrick Baker was the one that pulled the trigger and shot this guy, is he trying to claim self-defense? Like, I don't think that you can claim self-defense. I'm pretty sure you can't. While in the commission of a felony, a home invasion at that, and then also there's the, the double jeopardy situation that we're going to get to in just a little bit with this story. Like I said at the beginning of this, there's a lot of different moving parts to this. So that's this case in a nutshell that Patrick Baker originally was sentenced to 19 years in prison for. And if you ask me, dude got off. 19 years for killing a dude during a botched drug robbery and you was impersonating a peace officer? He should have just left well enough alone, but that wouldn't be the case, and this story gets much deeper. Let's go ahead and switch gears and get to the political aspect of this story, and let me introduce you to former Kentucky governor, Republican Matt Bevins, who just went down in what would appear a ball of flames in this last gubernatorial election, losing to a Democrat by the name of Andy Bashir. Now, I don't know much about this former governor, other than what's been reported about this guy. But one thing that I would read, because I wanted to know, well, one, who this governor lost to. I, I felt like that was important to know. And I ran across a, a story in the Rolling Stone. I just found interesting. It said Trump brags about GOP governor losing in state that he won by 30 points. I found that kind of interesting because, you know, they're both Republicans. Why would, you know, the former president be bragging about a Republican losing this gubernatorial race. Uh, but as I read the story, this was also interesting to know. That's where I learned who Matt Blevins, Matt Bevins lost to, uh, Democrat Andy Bashir. But I found this part to be interesting. They said, though Bevins was defeated by Democrat challenger Andy Bashir in the only statewide race not won convincingly by a Republican. The entire state of Kentucky, like every seat and, and, and every position that was available or that was up for grabs in this election was won by a Republican, except for the, for the governor's seat. I got to really think, you know, that says something about this particular guy as a governor. And trust me, there's a lot of controversy that surrounds this guy. We're going to get into that. But I mentioned this governor. It's a very important part to this story and also to the controversy that surrounds this guy. First, starting with the fact that Patrick Baker, well, more importantly, his family, had some pretty strong political ties, especially to this then governor, Matt Bevins. And I go next to this NBC story with a headline that says, uh, pardon Kentucky killer sentenced to 42 years in prison. Wait a minute. 42 years, 39 and a half years. Who's right? And this paragraph here that says, but media reports that Baker's family had political connections to Bevin and hosted a fundraiser for the former Republican governor that put a spotlight on the case. And why wouldn't it? Because it would be this former governor who would pardon Patrick Baker after only 30 months of a 19-year prison sentence for a home invasion murder in front of a guy's entire family. Now, let me share this. Just because he pardoned the guy doesn't mean that he made that conviction go away. I don't, I don't think that's how that works. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you get pardoned, does the conviction go away or do you just get released? I'm not clear on that information. If somebody knows better, please share down below. But Patrick Baker would get out because of his family's political ties. He would get pardoned. Right? Let's just, there's no other way that you can call this situation. Oh, no, you know, maybe it was something else. There's nothing else. The family was heavily connected to this governor. They hosted a fundraiser for this governor. The governor, the governor pardoned this guy amongst a list of other not so desirables, undesirables, like uh, amongst a list of other pretty fucked up people. I share with you a story from the Courier Journal. Got no idea what this is. Are they heavily political? I kind of get that sense. 
from this, but there is some interesting information that I share with you from a story with a headline that reads, by pardoning and killers, I probably had to blur that last word out, but you're reading it right there. Former Governor Matt Bevin showed us who he really is. And I'm like, okay, you know, that headline is horrendous. If he is pardoning those type of people, that one particular type of person especially, yeah, that's pretty messed up. But then I read some of the people that this guy pardoned. And, you know, I'm only going to briefly skim through this. Again, the story is down below if you want to read more about this yourself. Uh, the number one person that they mention in terms of controversial pardons was Patrick Brian Baker, who shot and killed a man in a home invasion five years ago. Bevin freed him after Baker's family hosted a political fundraiser for Bevin in 2018, raising $21,500. That's cheaper than getting an appeals lawyer. That's cheaper than getting an appeals lawyer. Think about that. If ever, you know, you're needing a reconsideration or you got somebody you're trying to help get out, maybe just host a political fundraiser. Raising $21,500 for him, that went directly to Bevin to repay himself money he loaned his 2015 election campaign. How about that? The man, you know, he was trying to become governor. He took it out of his own pockets, this $21,500. This family was able to raise that money and he was able to pay himself back. There you go. That doesn't seem corrupt at all. Another person right here, uh, Dayton Jones. I can't even begin to share the details of what this dude was locked up for. It is way too heinous. Definitely a bad, bad charge that he filmed and uploaded to the internet. If you want to read more about this guy, like I said, check out the story. Uh, Micah Scolette convicted last year, just a year ago. Another bad, bad charge. Sentenced to 23 years in prison. Not only is he free from prison, but, but he won't even have to register as an SO. A lot of controversial pardons that this governor was doing. So much, in fact, so much uh, pressure was put on this guy that he would actually have to tweet out, hey, I, I stand behind the decisions I made to pardon the people that I did. I read the case files. I knew who I was letting out. And obviously he felt like he was doing so for good reason. Yeah, right. Uh, who knows? Maybe the families of these folks kicked to this dude. Maybe they had heard through the grapevine, hey, yo, a Baker's family, they gave dude 21-5 and he got dude out. Man, dude probably got full up. Who gives, who cares that he lost the election? He went out in a, a ball of flames. The only Republican to lose in this state. Uh, political stance aside, boy, that's got to be embarrassing, you know? Especially as a governor, you're heavily political. At least I would feel so. Or you're just concerned about yourself. I'm just playing devil's advocate. I, I don't know that to be the case at all, but it's plausible. It's plausible. Why else would you let out these people? Horrendous, heinous charges. People who hadn't even begun to serve their time. Moving on. How do you get tried and convicted once? Then you get a, a gubernatorial pardon and real quick, I have got to look up what pardon means. Does it mean that the conviction is vacated? Does a pardon mean a conviction is vacated? No. A pardon does not remove the crime from your record, which would probably mean that the conviction stays as well. So if that's the case, just because this guy got pardoned, well, how did he go from 19 years to more than double that or about double that? Because... Again, this would sound like double jeopardy to me. I think back to my time getting in trouble. You know, this was always a fear of anybody that I knew. You know, thinking that you could walk into the courtroom, maybe a court date comes up unexpectedly, and you go into the courtroom and you're sitting in there, and the judge says, you know what, Mr. Foster, Mr. Gatorade, Froster, you know what, Mr. Frost? You, you can't even make this type of shit up. So, twice the batteries died while filming this video. Then the memory card was mysteriously full. I put another memory card in. I begin to film with that for just two seconds. And then it says, I need to format the memory card. So, here we are trying this again. You know what, Mr. Frost? We're going to dismiss all of your charges. You wouldn't even be able to believe it. You'd be like, what in the world? You're walking out of the courtroom worst fear. 
Worst case scenario, you walk out to the courtroom and there's some waiting men in black. Not like the movie, but the federal. The alphabet boys, they waiting right outside the courtroom for you talking about Mr. Frost, you're under arrest. Come with us. And I share that because like I said, that was always like the worst fear. Like you would walk into the courtroom and the, and the state would drop your charges. They would have to drop your charges or so it would seem because if the feds were going to pick up your case, well then to try you twice for the same charge would be double jeopardy, right? That's what it would sound like. And maybe some of you know better than I do, but I was introduced to a term this morning that I had never heard of. This is the loophole to double jeopardy. And what that is, it's called dual sovereignty doctrine. What? What? I tried to be like that guy on TikTok with the cowboy hat that does that. What? Dual sovereignty doctrine. What are we talking about? Federal prosecutors said Baker was prosecuted the second time under the dual sovereignty doctrine, which allows state and federal officials to prosecute the same defendant for the same actions without infringing on double jeopardy. How about that? Now, <laughs> that is some scary ass shit right there, right? They got a loophole for the double jeopardy, though. It's called dual sovereignty doctrine. And when I was first gathering the details of this in the notes and, you know, figuring out how I wanted to present this to you, hoping that my camera was going to work and my memory cards weren't going to get jammed up, when I, was, when I was trying to put this together, I was going to leave it with that. Hey, guess what? Double jeopardy can be wiped out by something called dual sovereignty doctrine. That's it. And just what I shared with you guys right there, that's what it means. But I wanted to go deeper than that because I investigatively report. Investigatively. So I looked up more on dual sovereignty doctrine and I'm going to share the link down below. Go look up this ncsl.org story that I've got linked down below. And for those of you who don't know what ncsl means, it's the National Conference of State Legislators. Folks, this is where they be making the laws, changing them joints too, and, and, and then arguing over whether certain laws should be changed, I think. It sounds like that's what they do. But anyways, as I was stumbling down the rabbit hole trying to learn more about dual sovereignty doctrine, I ran across this right here, where they share a case, Gamble versus the United States, because when it comes to these type of things, you always got to have case law and, and case studies that are perfect examples of situations like whatever the law is as to whether they should stand or whether they should be changed. At least, I think that's what it is. I'm no lawyer. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Joe, that's not what it is at all. But they've got cases as examples for things. And dual sovereignty doctrine, they've got Gamble versus the United States. I think it was back in 2019. Yes, in June of 2019, the Supreme Court ruled that dual sovereignty stays. That's what this story, uh, shit, it's right here on my phone. I didn't have to look at the computer screen. Uh, but there, I guess there was an argument as to whether or not, hey, this joint really, hey, this, I don't know what the argument was. Maybe, you know, it really is double jeopardy, right? A seven to two decision in Gamble versus the United States. It didn't. Ooh, it didn't stay. Maybe, maybe they got rid of it. I don't, I don't know. But this information would go on to say, the Double Jeopardy Clause provides that no person may be twice put in jeopardy for the same offense. Per the Dual Sovereignty Doctrine, the Supreme Court has long held that a crime under one sovereign's laws is not the same offense as a crime under the laws of another sovereign. So basically that in a nutshell means that what the state considers to be the law, well, the feds, the United States of America at that, uh, they can say it's just a little bit different, you know? And it's a totally different sovereign, state, feds. This also shares this whole Gamble versus the United States saying Terrence Gamble was prosecuted for and convicted 
of possession of a firearm by a, a convicted felon under both Alabama and United States laws. He argued the dual sovereignty doctrine should be overturned because founding era common law forbade successive prosecutions by different sovereigns. Justice Samuel Alito, writing for the majority of the court, disagreed. Yeah, states one sovereign, feds is another. So if they want to charge you the same, they can. If you get locked up for selling drugs, or you get caught with some drugs, let's just say, hey, it's addiction. You got caught with some some powder cocaine and some crack and some dog food and some e-pills and some oxycodones. You know, that's enough for the feds to say, let's go get them. When you've got that variety pack, so to speak, no pun intended, you know, you should be in fear that the feds can come pick that up. And how it was always told to me is, you know, the state, they're going to drop your case. And if they do, you're in trouble because the feds is coming to pick you up. But, th but this dual sovereignty doctrine basically says that doesn't have to be the case at all. If the state wants to smoke your boots, the feds can do so right afterwards. And guess what? You're going to serve that federal time first? How does it go? Because one of them, you're going to serve one before you serve the other. And I think the feds is going to get theirs first. But maybe not in all cases will that work out. You're going to serve one sentence for one sovereign. And then right afterwards, you're going to serve another for another one. And I don't think I've ever heard of the state and the feds running anything concurrent. Not going to say that it's never happened, but I've never heard of that. So those are going to be two consecutive sentences. Don't commit no crime, folks. I'm trying to tell you we're living in different times. Ooh. That rhymed. To get to the conclusion of all of this, like what happened? Patrick Baker, in 2014, did what he did, ran up in this house, dressed up like the feds, a U.S. Marshal, shot and killed Donald Mills in front of his family in a, in a botched drug raid. In 2017, he would receive a 19-year prison sentence. There was outrage over that, I'm sure. And after 30 months and a political fundraiser, he would be released and pardoned by a ball of flames ex-governor, Matt Bevins. He would be released in December of 2019. And then maybe sometime just recently, maybe not too long ago, I'm not exactly sure when this guy was rearrested, but he was rearrested. Re not only that, indicted by the feds for these same charges. And I'm guessing from this story, he just went to court and got his boots Smoked a lot more, at least, than he had previously with that 19-year prison sentence. He got sentenced to 39 and a half years in prison. And this story says that the judge could have sentenced Baker to life in prison. Instead, she chose to spare him that sentence in part because Baker and his accomplice did not barge in with the intent of killing. I guess the judge felt like they really were just going in there, impersonating federal law enforcement trying to find those drugs. You know how they say like it's different strokes for different folks and in this guy's particular case, man, it sure was that, wasn't it? Boy, this dude got off. He got out completely because of his family's political ties to the governor, right? But my oh my, in the end, how that seemed to have backfired. If they had just left well enough alone and he had just laid it down for the 19 years that he was sentenced to? Do you think the feds would have picked this case up? Maybe. There still could have been outrage over the, the sentence being not tough enough, not long enough. But ultimately, there was way more outrage over the fact that, that this guy got out, got pardoned by the governor after only 30 months. And I'm sure... Somebody took it as far as they possibly could, a family member of the victim, as they should have. Took it as far as they possibly could to get somebody involved, some higher up, some higher agency, right? Boy, they got the feds in on this joint. I can't even imagine what this dude was thinking when he got that indictment in the mail or that federal search warrant to come and arrest, that federal arrest warrant just popped up one day. Dude might have thought he was starting his life all over. Wild ass situation.
Should the addiction have been taken into consideration? Oh, you know, like I said, dude wasn't in his right frame of mind. I don't think so. But maybe there are some who will think that. Was 19 years enough at first? Like, was it was it one of those situations where, and I hate to throw this in here, but I got it written in my notes and I need to make sure I do. I quote Biggie Smalls, who said, and I quote, sprinkle coke on the floor, make it drug related. Right? Hey, I mean it was a it was a drug raid. Hey, they was they was cleaning up the streets. It just went wrong in front of dude's wife and his kids. You know, maybe just all these different devil's advocate type of things and moving parts with this particular story. Folks, that's all I've got on this story. I'd be curious to know what you guys have to say about this. I hope this was a video that you guys enjoyed. And if it was, please leave a like and a comment letting me know exactly what you thought about this. As always, until next time, enjoy life, the free world. Never take a moment for granted and make the most of every day. Peace!